Hello, everybody. Um, so I hope you are in the right room. So you see the slice name. Um, so a quick poll here. How many of you are using Scala? OK, not many. OK. Um, this talk is not about Scala. It's about building Scala. So, so hopefully that's good, because you don't, know, you don't need to know Scala. <coughs> How many of you are using Play or want to use Play? OK, there are more people. Good. <coughs> OK, so, <clears throat> so this is about, OK, this is a cutoff, but build happiness. Um, that's my daughter. I took this yesterday. This talk, first of all, we talk about Scala support in Gradle and play support in Gradle, which um, give us the continuous mode, the wonderful continuous mode, which Luke uh, demonstrated in the keynote yesterday. Uh, I, I believe also there are some other talks also um, <coughs> mentioned about this continuous mode. It has some demos. Who am I? I'm a software, I'm a software engineer at LinkedIn. I work for the development tools team. Uh, the keynote speaker today is actually my boss. Um, OK, yeah, that's the second line. I'm not a Scala expert. I have been using Scala for um, about a year and a half, but I, I don't want to claim I'm an expert of Scala. You know that, what that means, could mean. Um, I'm not a play expert either. We deal with play every day, um, but I don't really develop the front end application. I deal, deal with the building and tooling of play. So I may be a build expert given the past history. I worked a lot in things like and Maven, not a lot in make, anyway, that may be in the college. Um, and Maven and SBT, mostly nowadays, and Gradle. <coughs> a, a little bit about Scala. Um, so Scala is a object-oriented language. However, it has full support for functional programming, which is pretty uh, trending nowadays. The good thing about Scala is it's built on top of JVM, so it is strong typed, unlike others. Um, for LinkedIn, <coughs> we don't have a lot of um, Scala code base. And only 1.5% of our code base, based on, on line of code, is actually Scala. And uh, in comparison to Java, has 25.1%. You can guess what is the um, biggest um, Take the biggest share here for our code base. It's actually JavaScript. <laughs> yeah, it's, I believe it's like one third, something like that. Or, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, close to that. <coughs> and so, most people probably know if you have tried Scala, given uh, the tutorials and everything, it is using SBT to build. And SBT used to be, I believe, used to be called Simple Build Tool. And nobody really give a shit about that. <laughs> uh, so now the, the spin is like Scala build tool. Uh, it's indeed can build Java and maybe some other things. But <coughs> still, comparing to Gradle, the, at least the building part, uh, the automation part, is um, far, far um, behind what Gradle can do. However, it can do uh, work with the um, Scala ecosystem because it's, na uh, it's more like a native, something built by TypeSafe. <coughs> um, so it is de facto built too for Scala community. Um, and also, it got all the native support for compiling Scala code. It got very nice incremental build. And you can always get the um, first. <coughs> um, so here's what happens you always get the first. The, the most um, features from TypeSafe in uh, SBT or, or the, their compiler, which is, which is called Zinc. But it may well be uh, <coughs> later will be propagated to Zinc so that Maven or uh, Gradle can build it as well. And it also uh, tightly <coughs> integrated with a lot of good things in the Scala community, Specs2, for example. And um, there are also a lot of plugins. I, I, don't, I don't get a count, but I don't think um, the number of plugins 
should be like tens of dozens plugins probably <laughs> for Scala. And the language SBT really uses, they claim it is a DSL, but if you really take a look of it, it is Scala code. And you can use build.sbt, which is something a closure somehow transformed into, fit into the Scala code and fit into SBT. So the DSL is built on top of Scala. It's actually native Scala. The good thing is, it is Scala. You can do a lot of things with it. The bad thing is, if you really want this to be a DSL, uh, then it's too, people are not going to do that, basically. People do a lot of things what they want. They, uh, they do their own logic. So there are a lot of things. That's why um, at LinkedIn, we don't really use build.sbt because it's not possible to only use build.sbt. We have to use um, build.scala to, to write a fully um, Scala code to control the build. The dependency management engine used by, uh, by SBT is Ivy. Basically, um, you define those dependencies in um, Ivy format, so you will have um, the uh, Ivy's organization name and uh, version and some configurations maybe, and then they will be uh, outsourced to Ivy. So the Ivy engine will actually get that and resolve everything and give, give it back to you, the resolved. Um, it's a file pass, it's ca they, they call it update <coughs> report, which is basically is the, uh, where I can find those files, jars, and what are the configuration or some of the name associated with those files. It got the continuous compilation, it got the testing deployment. Um, so it's pretty good for Scala developers. Um, however, it has its own problems. We'll talk about that soon. So now it's a feature comparison between the Scala and uh, the SBT and the Gradle. We can see the DSL language <coughs> are both sort of dynamic language. Um, Scala is not pure dynamic, but you can think that way. Um, Groovy is more dynamic it's in a true sense. It's, it is dynamic. You can actually uh, interpret it. You can add, throw in more um, classes, functions. And SPD right now, I believe, mostly supports only Scala and Java. And for Gradle, you guys know that. That's a lot more. The in incremental Scala build is um, natively provided from SBT. And for Gradle, this is something if you want to build a Scala code using Gradle, by default, right now, by default, Scala, uh, Gradle uses the ant compiler. So you will see ant Scala C to compile all your Scala code, which is not incremental. And the, the Zinc compiler has been there for a couple of years, I think. But it's still not turned on by default. Uh, we don't have a problem turning it on by default. So I would just suggest you, if you want to go there and just try to enable the Zinc compiler. Also, SBT has an interactive shell. Uh, first, SBT itself will give you a SBT shell uh, console, so you can interact with the, this constantly. Also, it can invoke the Scala repo from the SBT console, which gives you all the class paths of your build or of your or of your application, so that you can um, do something there, like just like you do things in Python or some other um, languages. That's nice, and Gradle doesn't have it right now. In May. For the multi-module support, both of them have it. And the dependency management, which one is based on Ivy. So for Gradle, actually, Gradle was using Ivy, if, you, uh, if any of you know. And it was so painful, and they wrote their own. That's probably in Gradle 1.0, yeah. <clears throat> and continuous mode. So it wasn't there. Like This study was reused from uh, <coughs> Uh, some talk last year, and there, there it was a no. Now it's yes. This is um, something really, really exciting. Also, for the vendor and the community support, um, this is my, given my personal um, experience. So I got better support from Gradle, comparing to um, TypeSafe. Also, uh, for LinkedIn, LinkedIn invested a lot in Gradle. So we have a lot of tooling 
already associated using Gradle. Have, we have a lot of RAM, uh, Gradle plugins which we can use directly. The problem for SBT is um, if we want to do the same, we have to do the same thing twice. So, <clears throat> Scala supporting Gradle is provided via well, something called Scala plugin. The Scala plugin actually is from very beginning of Scala. If you take a look at their release notes, it was from Scala, uh, Gradle 0 0.8, which is like the second um, public version of Gradle. The, the first one is 0 0.7. And that was from September 2009. And in 2012, and the Zinc, uh, so basically the compiler for Scala is extracted to Zinc. And then Gradle started to use Zinc, started to support Zinc to compile Scala classes. So, so it has been there for two and a half years. I, I, I'd say it's pretty stable, although it's not turned on by default. If you want to use it, please. Now, let's do some demo on how Gradle can compile Scala and Java and also some joint compilation. I will point some uh, a little problem there. I was doing my own examples, but then I thought uh, there are wonderful examples from Gradle's you know, uh, distribution, so why not? Let's see this. Uh, samples. Scala. So there are some samples. Let's just go to quick start. OK. So as you can see, this is um, this is big enough, right? OK, good. Mm, let me make this bigger. So in this example, you will see only uh, two classes, two Scala files, not necessary classes. And there's a trade person in the API. And this is the Im input class for that trade. And now there's a test for it. OK, th those Scala files are easy and no different. This is how we can actually build Scala using uh, the build a Gradle file for, the, for this Scala project. Um, the first one doesn't uh, really um, doesn't relevant here. The, the second line, apply plugin Scala. You apply Scala plugin. Then you're adding the Maven Central repository. And now you define the com dependency just as the dependency you define in any Java project for Gradle. Um, the only caveat here is you have to, so I don't know why this is in two dependencies, but it can be one. You have to de define your Scala library um, dependency directly in this builder Gradle dependencies. Uh, this is a little bit different than SBT. Like SBT can uh, infer your Scala version. So like if you depends on another library, which depends on s uh, another Scala li uh, library, I mean Scala land <coughs> library, then SBT actually can infer that. I, I see Scala 2.10 or I see Scala 2.11. So you don't have to directly um, d specify this dependency. In Gradle, we have. Um, but that should be fine, because basically you really want to specify your Scala version. You don't want to you know, open that to any Scala version. That will cause you a lot of pain. So I, I bet this is no different than whatever uh, you have seen for other, uh, um, for other Java project. Now we can build it. So you can see, you see the tasks. Um, so it has to download the JUnit 412. Guess that's pay, maybe too old. Um, so you see compile Java happens first. Then it's compile Scala. Um, by convention, the Scala classes are in source main Scala, and the Java classes are in source main Java. And there's one thing, which is in this case, 
because that convention, you cannot depend, you cannot, your Java class under source main Java cannot use any class in your source main Scala. Um, so there are two ways to fix that. One way is um, you just put all your classes in source main Scala because Scala compiler doesn't really care if it's Scala or Java. Um, the other way is you can actually um, define your source, the source set for the Scala <coughs> compilation to both source main Java and source main Scala. Um, just to note, this is another difference between SBT and Scala. For SBT, by default, it only uses Scala compi uh, compiler to compile everything. So the um, source main Java is already being considered. You can freely re reference class from each other. But in here, without doing something <coughs> using the default settings, you can only do one way, from Scala to Java. Um, also, we can run tests. Uh, check, I think. <coughs> it should invoke that test, um, which is really fast. Oh, it already did. Okay, build is already did that. So that is easy, right? <coughs> like any of your Java classes, you just apply this compile uh, Scala plugin, and out of the box, it works. <coughs> but there are many limitations, some of them I already mentioned. The Scala version can only be, cannot be inferred from the dependencies. You have to give the Scala version very explicitly. And there's no Scala, co Scala version, conf conflict Scala version validation. What does that mean? Uh, so if you know Scala, you probably know Scala has a bunch of versions 2.9, 2.10, 2.11, and 2.12 going to be. And even for, uh, so for those minor versions, 2.10 to 2.11, for example, they are, even though at the source level, they can be backwards compatible, however, at the ABI level, they are not, which means you have to recompile your uh, Scala source one more time if you want to target a different version. Also, when you're consuming all your Scala um, dependencies, you have to consume the same version, uh, same like 2.210 or 2.11 version of your Scala. Um, so what could happen is, it depends on two different Scala versions, uh, two different Scala libraries. One compiled against Scala 2.10, one compiled against Scala 2.11. Now, I have a con Scala version conflicts. And I cannot have them work together, because in the end, I, will, I can only um, have one Scala land library jar in my JVM class pass. So I have to decide which one you need to use. Um, in SBT, it actually has some kind of validation mechanism. It will actually examine all the, your dependencies, resolve dependencies, and see if, you use, uh, if it has conflict suffix for Scala version. And um, Gordon doesn't have it, and it is possible you may um, accidentally pull in different versions of Scala libraries. So you have to be watch out for that. Also, there's no cross-build support. What does that mean? What does the cross-build mean? Uh, so I mentioned the, the binaries are different even though the source are the same if you're targeting two different Scala versions, 2.10 or 2.11. So this is what they, what they did the type save did um, so that they can support both. See, um, so as easy as, I will compile twice. I will compile against Scala 2.10, then publish, like I'm full, I will publish full underscore 2.10. And I will compile against Scala 2.11, then I um, <coughs> publish another full underscore 2.11. So by attaching the suffix to my name, um, you can differentiate, this is our two different versions for Scala. And also, when you resolve your dependencies, um, for SBT, they have something, try to be smart, so that you specify your Scala version, you use percent percent instead of a percent um, when, you, when you're adding your dependencies, so that it will automatically guess the Scala version, attach the suffix for you. Um, SP, um, Gradle doesn't have it. And so you have to specify the full name. For example, I'm putting full 
uh, underscore 210 or full underscore 211. And if you, don't, if you are not being careful, it's possible you put in the um, different versions. Again, let's go back to the first one, the no conflicting scalar version validation. Um, also on the cross build, there's no cross build um, plugins right now, uh, open source plugins right now for cross building. So you can release one, but if you want to target another one, um, you have to change your build, maybe then run the build again, publish again. Uh, internally at LinkedIn, we do have a um, Scrader plugin to do the cross build support. Basically, you specify the scalar versions I want to targeting, and then it will build the artifacts for e uh, for both scalar versions, then publish them. I don't know if we have planned to open source that though. <coughs> Native specs to integration, also oh IDE integration and um, the Gradle. <coughs> So the bad ID integration, what I really mean here is the Gradle building Scala. If you think of Gradle itself uh, in general, it is more or less fine. But if you think uh, broader, like you have Scala classes, you have uh, specs to test, you have play especially, then the uh, ID integration supported by uh, IntelliJ, which they have a um, very good Scala plugin for IntelliJ, which is actually uh, also or the Scala IDE, which is Eclipse based. Just um, if you are really want to use Scala, I would recommend using um, IntelliJ instead of Eclipse. Um, also, I can tell you, type type folks also use IntelliJ more than they do in uh, Eclipse. Um, so, Gradle, whatever you are building Scala, is a second word, <coughs> second class citizen in that Scala world. Like anybody here ever use Gradle to build Scala? Okay, one. Yeah, so anybody use, uh, when, if you do Scala, uh, you use CSPT, I would assume, right? So we can see that. Um, so that's, that's all for Scala. And Scala is just uh, the foundation language which Play is built on top of. So Play is a front end framework. Which does, so the, the, the best, not the best thing, but one of the best things Play does is they have a asynchronized I.O. Which means um, if you don't like JavaScript, if you don't want to use Node, you can use this. They have a pretty good uh, web server, which is JBoss Natty based. And they are actually uh, replacing that in, Scala, uh, in Play 2.4, yeah, those versions. Like Gradle got just released 2.4 and Play just released 2.4. So for Play 2.4, they already uh, added something they call Akka HTTP, which is used to be um, the Spray library, which is the HTTP server behind. Uh, it's going to be the uh, HTTP server behind Play. Uh, at the moment, it's still JBoss uh, Netty. And the best thing the web developers love about Play is the hard reloading. You know, comparing to other Java EE uh, alternatives. You don't have to wait until your application server to restart. You don't know how long that could take. Also, you don't have to pay premium to JRebel to do something, you know, uh, reloading. For, for Play, <coughs> this is a built in from the beginning, and that is based on their uh, stateless nature. So you don't really put a lot of things in your memory, uh, the, the state. So you can put the state somewhere else so that the web application can be um, more or less stateless. Also, uh, play, this build here actually means it's using SBT as the build infrastructure. And the, <coughs> okay, yeah, support both Java and Scala for play. So you can use Java, you can use Scala, it doesn't really matter. Um, in Play 2.4, 2. 2 point version, still um, Scala is a, a little bit first class citizen for them. And the feature um, provided for using the Java API is a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit, not on par with the, what Scala API could, could provide. Um, however, their plan is for Play 3.0. All Java and Scala APIs will be first-class season. 
So be aware of that. Also, I believe starting uh, with Play 3.0, um, they will only support Java 8. That's why they can use, clo uh, they can use um, the Clojure and uh, some other good stuff from Java 8. Uh, at LinkedIn, we have 159 plus Play applications. So that's not, um, that's not a small number. So yeah. <coughs> and why we thought about to build Play on Gradle? The first and the foremost thing is about the dependency resolution. I don't know how many of you really had pain with IV in, you know, before you use Gradle. JC, I know you we did. <laughs> okay, I did. <laughs> um, and so the IV, uh, the, the resolution, <coughs> the dependency resolution for IV is quite slow. And the worst case, we have a SPD project which has, I believe, 70 plus sub projects. And to resolve all the dependencies, if I remember correctly, it's a, um, in the beginning, it was like 40 minutes or so. And granted, there was something we did wrong. And we fixed those things we did wrong, and still, it's about 15 minutes. Why? Because for uh, the way <coughs> SPD handles the resolution to IV is per sub-project. Even though you have three sub-projects, may have more or less the same class pass, and the, the same, even though the same set of dependencies, it will resolve three times. It won't just use whatever uh, result it got. Also, because the nature of IV is not even process safe. And if you ever use SBT, you will notice, OK, this is waiting, waiting. Like if you have two builds, you will see this is waiting for the lock for IV. And the other process um, will build then. So even within the same project, each of the sub project will be dedicated separately. That's why everything is in, uh, in a sequence. If you think each of the sub-projects takes about 15 seconds, which is, I think, reasonable, and then you time that to 70. That's a lot of waiting time on the uh, dependency resolution. OK, so that's first and foremost. Also, this will tremendously simplify our process. And we already have a lot of things using Gradle. And um, if we can you know, put one less build system away, that would be tremendous help. And if we can get rid of Ant, Maven, or put everything on Gradle, that would be ideal. But of course, we are not g getting there anytime soon. Unify our build technologies that goes to that point. And don't repeat yourself. As I said, we have already done, so here's the example. We have already done all these things in Gradle through our Gradle plugins. And all of them has to be rewritten in SBT one more time. What's the point? <coughs> so now, what's really involved when you try to build, play on Gradle? So this is the, the last one actually missing from this. I have to do this a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Oops. Okay. So there are actually for building, there are four different stages for if you are building play. So first of all, for play, they have their own routing systems. And the first thing is you have to build that. It's a configuration file, however, it will be converted, translated, built into compiled into a Scala class. Then this Scala class will eventually be uh, being built, uh, used when they are building everything else. So that's the first step you have to do. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's the second. The first one is access processing and packaging, which is not um, interesting here. Um, so there are some things like as, uh, CSS, um, um, <coughs> images, minification, um, there are stuff like the uh, JavaScript, CoffeeScript translation, and things like that. So those actually will happen uh, before, first thing. And the second thing is the routes compilation. 
All the routes is in a configuration file, which will be compiled or will be converted into a Scala source file. And the third one is the Toro template compilation. And Toro templation is something uh, Play uses. Um, basically, it's something like if you think JSP or whatever templating system, and you can including stuff, um, changing stuff, then um, there are, uh, you can even write not fully functional uh, Scala code there, but to some extent, then they can be um, converted into another Scala class. Only after that, <coughs> it's going to be the Scala Java compilation. So now you have everything in Scala source files. You just compile them, all of them. And this is for building part. After that, for play developers, the good thing is you can just start a server in development mode right there from your console. You just do run, and then you will have your application up. And this thing can support hard reload, like you change any Java class or Scala class automatically. It will reload the whole application. And uh, if you really make it stateless, have all your state somewhere else, maybe in the request headers, maybe in your uh, DB layer, maybe somewhere, then you can just see your application seamlessly. You know, um, So all your changes taking effect immediately, in seconds. Um, and then if you verify everything locally, it's great. Then probably you want to do the um, binary packaging. By binary packaging, I really mean the jar. So you package all the jars, packaging all the Java byte code classes files into jars. And eventually, you packaging the distribution, which can be any uh, TGZ or zip. Then you can just unzip it. So unzip it anywhere, then just run that. Um, <coughs> The, the, the scripts from the, the Bing directory so that you can start your server from anywhere. So it's not a war you deploy to application server. It's everything as one uh, unit. You have that, and then you write it. So, in, so what really isn't there, if you think about this, <coughs> this um, diagram? The, the Java Scala compilation is there. It has been there since 2009. And this is not, this is not, this is not, and this is not. What about those two? Those are just packaging. You just tell the, you know, the, the plugin where to grab this file, maybe rename it some, somewhere else. That's there. So we don't worry about that. All we need is one, two, three, and five. <coughs> so we set some. Uh, we we work this with Gradle together. Gradle built it, and um, there are some milestones we set. The first milestone is we can use Gradle to build a play application. By build, we mean really you can generating the distribution. You can run a server, uh, but unfortunately at that time you cannot do the hard reload because that's harder. Um, for the hard reload. <coughs> That's the milestone too. And the first step to get to the hard reload, as you can see, is the continuous mode. You have to watch these things are changing. If something changed, you do something. And of course, the third milestone is we just put this in production. Everybody uses it. Make it real. And I'm happy to say this we are at here right now. We have the milestone to finish just you know, a little bit ahead of this Gradle Summit. We have the continuous mode. We have hard reload. And I will demo that in a minute. <coughs> the building application, so this is going to be an easy one. Let's see this. So again, in the, <coughs> in the all-in-one um, download of Gradle, you will see all those samples. Yeah, that's why I didn't want to use my own samples. We should just download the Gradle nightly. Please download the Gradle nightly. Um, because Tufo does have some of them, but don't have the most recent one. So use nightly, please. And you will see three um, play projects, which you can do. Now, this is a play project. I'm going to show you what this looks like. 
play I lost it. So first thing you might notice is the uh, the directory structure is a little bit the, the directory layout is a little bit different. It's not the, the Maven convention source main or something. So anything actually um, by default, you can configure everything, but by default, all your classes, Java or Scala, goes into the app directory. This is for your app. And uh, the conf, you will have your application configuration. You will have your routes file, basically. From where, goes to which controller. So the controller will be your Scala method, a job, whatever, in, in the end, that JVM method you are going to invoke for that uh, route. <coughs> And all your static assets will be in your public directories. And tests will be in the uh, test directory. So, by, so first, first thing is, you can see uh, everything Java or Scala will be in under app. So you don't really care if, um, if you have that cross uh, compilation. Java cannot reference Scala problem, because this is a play. Um, yeah, if you are interested, I can show you this. Uh, is there templating <coughs> um, syntax, just like that? We are going to do something over there uh, later. So first thing I'm going to show you is we can build it. And also, the tests are being invoked. And this build doesn't uh, really generate in the distribution. Let me do the dist. And thanks to the incremental build, we can do this real quick. So now, under the build directory, you will see this play distributions, which is a zip. And you can actually uh, run, you can, you can just publish this to your, uh, to your re repositories. But uh, here, we are not going to do that. We are just going to um, show we can run the server. And the task to run the server is just a gradle run. <coughs> so now it's started. It's pretty fast, because play is lightweighted. Now, go into the browser. You will see this is <coughs> the application we just um, started. And I can refresh. I can because this is pretty simple. Um, th they are using their own um, templating. I can remove that, but that's yeah, that's a demo for later. Okay, I'll do that later. But basically, this is it. You can you can just start your play application real fast this way. <coughs> OK, so now we can talk a little bit about uh, the different, <coughs> how you can do things a little bit differently in, uh, in Gradle for different types of play projects. So in this example, you will see, uh, in this sample directory, you will see three play examples. And the basic ones is the one I just showed you. It's just one play project. And there's a, and also you, if you might notice <coughs> in the build a Gradle file, Oh, I didn't show you this. Sorry. Yeah. So this is how the build Gradle file is for the basic project. So very simple. You just apply the plugin play. Then you define your dependencies. In this case, you only define the comments land. And for testing, you depend. Uh, you specify the Guava, Google Guava. And you may notice this is no longer using the compile or um, compile test. Is using the play configuration. Um, the repository is, is a little bit different. Uh, so you have to specify the Maven, a uh, different Maven directories for a uh, different Maven repository for this thing is because there are some things not on Maven Central, <laughs> only hosted by TypeSafe. So you might notice there's no like what play version I'm using, or um, what Scala version this is, right? It's not here. This is using the default one. I believe it's 237, uh, uh, play 237 and Scala 210. Um, maybe here. Yeah, 237. You are using play 237. <coughs> so
So now I can show you an example, another example which actually configures more stuff. So this advanced sample is still one single project. However, it specifies, first of all, uh, CoffeeScript plugin. That's another plugin if, you really, uh, if you're using CoffeeScript in your, play uh, in your play project. You can apply that, and it will <coughs> convert those for you. Also, you can specify different play. So you, you might notice this is a model components play. So which means all the play plugin are built on top of the new rule-based configuration model. And this will make sure this is super fast also. Um, also, the, um, yeah, basically it makes it really fast and, and so that you, ha you have a, a, a new way to use when, you, um, when you're going forward. Now the dependencies uh, and repositories are no different than before. So this is the way you specify your play version, your Scala version. And I believe it's possible you can change the Scala version to something else due to the time. I'm not going to show you that. Now, since we are getting a little bit <coughs> more interested, like in, at LinkedIn, we don't have any one single project play application. All our play applications are actually uh, multi-module, multi-subjects, uh, multi-sub-projects. Here's an example of that, something like that. Now, in this <coughs> multi-project sample, you actually define three different play projects. You have an admin, you have a user, you have a util. Um, three project dependencies. And the first two are actually play. They are play projects. And the third one is ju just a regular Java project. And go into each one of them. So in modules, util, just, I, just plug in Java. Oh, this one is actually using the new syntax. It's a different syntax than the apply uh, plugin syntax. And for user project, it is a play project. It actually um, uses the util project. Similarly, here for the admin, you know, exactly the same. Just apply play. Now, all three projects will be, um, eventually will be built into the top level Play application. Why is that? Because for Play, it is possible to consolidate different Play projects into one. Like you have different endpoints, and then you have one top level Play project which goes into the controller and the routes of each of the individual ones. That's some kind of things you can, you know, imagine you can have two projects, one for your um, API, one, API version one, another project for your API version two. They, can, they don't have to be in one project. Then you have a consolidated project, which has both of them. And also, you can testing them individually. You don't have to always have both up and testing. So that is the samples we have for play. <coughs> Let's quickly get this one. So now, <coughs> continuous mode. And you probably already see um, what Luke did in the keynote yesterday. Um, so the continuous mode, basically, the gradle will block there, will wait for any user changes. And if it detects any user change, it will rerun whatever the task you were actually asking it to do. Um, the, this Continuous mode only support Java 7 and above because it leverages the new watch service from the JVM. This is only uh, from Java 7. And I'm going to use um, the Scala project to demonstrate real quick. I have one minute. So this is the test. So what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to just run a test, dash t test. And you will see, now it blocked there, watching for changes for the user input. So I'm going to break the, break the uh, test. So for example, I'm making it not, uh, this is fine. Actually, just 
making not compound, right? Come on. Did I save? I think I did. Uh, maybe I, I didn't. OK, this is not IntelliJ. I'm sorry. Um, so you see, immediately you will see this um, failed. <clears throat> and now let's get it back. And you will see the test passed. A uh, very good use case for this is you can actually have writing your unit test and have this running, keep running. And it will keep, keep doing and doing and doing. And, and in the end, you just go switch to your console. Oh, everything passed. You don't have to worry about you know, running tests and this. Or maybe you have them side by side and see everything there. And uh, quickly, on the play hard reload thing, I'm just going to show you. This is how the hard reload happens. Uh, when the browser really make a new request, there's something called build link inside the JVM, which watches the source and it's, OK, it's dirty. I have something changed then the building will create a new class loader to load in all the new classes and just ditch the old class loaders. That's how the uh, reload really uh, happens. And for this, I think I should show you one more thing before I close this. Um, can we, yeah, let, let me finish this, then I, I will take your question. So now I'm running the server again. This is the same server I just ran. So now it's up. And we go back to the, um, the play <coughs> project. and change something there. So for the controller, I'm changing this to rendering that template to And now, uh, let's see what happens in the console. Come on. This is in the, oh, that's why. Yeah, this is in multi-project. I was running the basic one. Sorry. One second. OK. Yeah, you see, that happened. After that's saved, this recompilation happened. And you can actually see this changes to OK. That is the magic. Um, and now, thank you. And um, for the questions, because we are running out of time, we can just talk after this. OK, sure. Um, when you switch class loaders, sure. can any objects be, uh, do you still keep the same objects? When you no, no, do you have state? That's why we have to make this stateless. Okay, so it has to be stateless, right? Yes. So objects, if object doesn't have a state, how different is it than a new object? Right. And so, the, the, the key thing here is you don't keep any state for that. That's the, all the problem you run into when you're using JRabbit or you want to use uh, the Java, you keep a session, then you cannot do that. Just simply doesn't work that way, right? But can there be old, mm -hmm. old code that's running with the old class loader while after you do the switch? No. After you do the switch, that class loader is do not being used. Slow over on the other side? Um, it's possible you may experience some kind of memory leak, but not slow. Because anyway, that part is. No, it's slow, and then, then you get a memory leak. And we said talk about uh -huh. slowly. You switch class loaders, mm -hmm. and then you get a memory leak. Yeah, the memory leak is certainly we have seen that. And the, um, for in the most cases, remember this this is only for the developers, for your local quick iterations. And for in production, you are not going to have this. It's only enabled for, uh, for the developer you don't build. Have, you don't have no. In no, no, that's not, that's not uh, intended. Uh, th this is only for developers, only locally, and using uh, and also build system specific, right? You rely on either SBT or Gradle to provide you that information. Something changed, and I have to reload. So production doesn't. Yeah, sure.
Uh, sure. What I did is I just uh, create a wrapper around the activ activator binary. <laughs> so, uh -huh. so I still I still use Gradle to match dependency, and I think that's taking the library into the lib folder of the the application and the uh -huh. file is very simple. We and yeah, we actually thought about that idea. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. True. I, I, Sorry, so, we're going to have to break for lunch. Yeah, sure. So, yeah. I'm, thank you, everybody, for being here. And uh, I can still take your questions. Yeah.